Good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me uh, give a preview of next week, which will be Dr. David Sobel talking on engaging patients as partners, effective behavior change strategies for busy clinicians. So please do join us for that. Today it's a special pleasure not only to introduce one of our own, but to introduce one of our, uh, one of our young faculty members, which I think is always a special treat for all of us here at, uh, at Medical Grand Rounds. Jonathan Chen is a uh, graduate of uh, UCLA with a BS in uh, cybernetics and a specialization in computer studies. He won a variety of awards and uh, <clears throat> recognitions while he was at UCLA. He then went off to, uh, to UC Irvine where he's uh, part of the medical scientist training program and received both his uh, MD and PhD from Irvine before we were fortunate to uh, recruit him here to Stanford where he did his house staff training in the internal medicine residency uh, 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 program. While he was a resident, he was very active in, uh, in research, including uh, applying competitively for a series of grants and winning a series of awards for, uh, for his research, largely through the uh, Informatics Society. Upon finishing his residency, Jonathan moved over to the Palo Alto VA, where he did a fellowship or is in, in uh, medical informatics and working in the VA Center for Innovation to Implementation under the direction of, uh, of Steve Ash. He now has uh, joined the uh, Stanford Department of Medicine faculty as an instructor in the Division of uh, General Medical Disciplines. He is being mentored on a K award by a multidisciplinary group that includes Steve Ash, Mary Goldstein, Russ Altman, and Nigam Shaw. And so it's with, uh, with great pleasure that I introduce you to Jonathan Chen, who's going to talk to us on wisdom of the crowd or tyranny of the mob. So join me in welcoming Jonathan. Thank you, Dr. Herring, and thank you all. Good morning, and for this great privilege to be able to present to you today. Sharing some work that really I started conceiving of back from my own experiences right here as an intern in the medicine residency program. It was back in the day when I was routinely tasked with taking care of complex patients with challenging medical decisions to make. Um, often that would be an outside hospital transfer. I'd read the reason for transfer, higher level of care. And I would think to myself, wait a second, is, is that me? Am, am, am I the higher level of care? Because to tell you the truth, I'm not really sure what to do for this patient who has acute leukemia and a heart attack who has AIDS, cancer, obstructive neuropathy, and is unconscious for no good reason. And you know what, I looked it up to date, I pulled out my textbook, I did a search on PubMed, and there were no places I could look for that would give me the answer about what to do. So what could I do? Well, in the status quo of medical practice right now, um, all doctors can do, you have to make the best guess you can for your patients, um, given the information you have, typically based on your own anecdotal experience and individual expert opinion. This unfortunately leads to a wide expanse of undesirable clinical practice variability. If you're just one patient with one disease and you showed up at 10 different hospitals, you could very easily end up with 10 different courses of treatment. Now that's going to compromise both your quality and your cost efficiency of healthcare. To be fair, a lot of that variability is actually due to uncertainty when we have to practice in the context of a medical knowledge base that is simultaneously incomplete and yet progressively expanding uh, much more rapidly than the cognitive capacity of any human individual. So what do I mean by that? Um, dirty little secret about evidence-based medicine. What percent of clinical practice uh, guideline recommendations are based on high quality level A evidence? It's like 11 percent. You know, half of them are basically expert opinion. Um, so which means on a daily basis that all the medical decisions you make, there actually is no good answers to tell you what to do. And you might argue, well, all that really means is we just need to do more research. Do more research, you will eventually be able to figure out the answers to all the medical questions you want to know. I actually think that's fundamentally impossible given the combinatorial and dynamic nature of medicine, but even for argument's sake, let's say that were possible, all we have to do is just do more research. This picture in the bottom right is actually from kind of a joke article from the New England Journal many years ago, where the guy here is literally taking the weight of medical knowledge. He's weighing on a scale the index medicus, it's kind of the precursor to PubMed. He does it again many years later and laments there's an exponential growth in the weight of medical knowledge that we're responsible for. And right now, there are more than 75 randomized control trials, 11 systematic reviews being published every single day. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but at that rate, I am way behind in terms of keeping up with the literature. We are at a point, well past the point, where the complexity of modern medicine exceeds the capacity of the unaided expert mind. So what are some ways we can try to manage this? Well, we can do clinical decision support constructs in the meaningful use area of electronic medical records. 
So these are things like your order sets, your best practice alerts, and your templates. And um, they have been found in very specific um, cases to help things like renally dosing your medications or avoiding excessive blood transfusions. Um, one systematic review found that 94% of the trials of such interventions uh, really can improve clinical practice as long as they satisfy a few key criteria. Um, that it is integrated as part of your actual clinical workflow, it's an automated part of the computer system, it happens at the point of care where you're making a decision, and it's making overt actual recommendations about what to do. Even still, there are a lot of open challenges um, to being able to use this effectively. Probably one you're most familiar with is things like alert fatigue. I mean, how many more alerts do you want the computer to get in your way to do your work? Um, what I think this points to is actually a much bigger scope problem, which is what I'm interested in, is addressing the fact that this is still dependent on a top-down authoring and distribution model, right, which leads to a scalability issue. When you have to develop and deploy an intervention one issue at a time, one alert at a time, there's only so far you can get with that to cover the complexity and comprehensiveness of medicine. So there's uh, other people have put forth the grand challenge, which is what I'm trying to approach. How do you learn clinical decision support from the bottom up more organically, given clinical data sources? So come back to my story as a, when I was a medicine intern, taking care of complex patients, not really sure what to do. Well, actually, I'm surrounded by an entire department of master clinicians and educators. If I'm not sure what to do, well, that doctor is very experienced. She seems to know what she's doing. I bet she's seen something like this before. I'll just go ask her. I bet um, she could give me advice on how to take care of my patient. But these experts are not always going to be available to me. So what can I do if they're not always going to be accessible? Well, I thought to myself, you know what I wish? I wish I could kind of forgo the privacy laws and just sneak a peek into that doctor's charts. Because I bet if I saw the last time she took care of a patient like mine, I bet I could learn something from that to figure out how to take care of my own patient. Although running with that idea further, why am I looking at just one doctor's chart? Why don't I look at everybody's chart and see what the last thousand doctors did for their similar patients? I bet I could learn even more from that. Well, that concept I just described, that is basically how a recommender system works. Collaborative filtering, market basket analysis, you bought this book on Amazon, well, other people who also bought this book, maybe you'll like it too. So very broadly speaking, what my interest and goal has been is to see if such an approach can be applied to clinical decision making, and in that sense, uniquely close the loop on both the afferent and efferent limbs of a learning healthcare system. But of course, open questions remain on whether doing so is going to actually be predictive of real clinical practice patterns, patient outcomes, and align with established standards of care. So that's actually what most of my talk is going to be about, broken down to three major sections or kind of projects to explore different aspects of that theme, uh, the first being a collaborative filtering approach. So how are we going to do this? Well, if you want to do anything, first you need the data. So I went to the Stride Clinical Data Warehouse Group, something that's accessible to any Stanford uh, researcher or affiliate, and I said, I want to see every patient who is hospitalized at Stanford, and particularly what I want to see are their clinical orders. That's the doctor's orders for your lab tests, your imaging, your medications. Um, eventually, I rolled in things like laboratory results and diagnosis codes, but really it was the orders that I wanted. Because right? often, as I used to tell my own interns, I mean, you can write a 10-page history and physical if you feel like. You can discuss a differential diagnosis of a dozen esoteric diseases. At the end of the day, the only thing that's actually going to count is what did you finally decide to actually order for your patient. That is the concrete manifestation of your clinical decision making. With that in mind, um, I took the data, did a lot of pre-processing work to try to model my patients as a simple timeline of labeled events. Right, so this would be the example data for one patient. The idea here is once you've done that, it then becomes very easy to ask co-occurrence questions. So how often does an order for an EKG get followed by an order for a chest x-ray within one hour of each other? That's now very easy to answer that question. Well, in that case, let's just systematically answer that question for all pairwise combinations of items. Um, you can then drop those numbers into two-by-two two contingency tables from which you can drive several association statistics. You can also derive um, different kinds of statistics, things like support, confidence, lift, and interest. These are actually things that derive from the market basket analysis literature. So what is this market basket analysis thing I keep talking about? So this is when if you go to the supermarket and um, you can sign up for a club card and then they will give you free discounts on your groceries if you do this. So why are they doing that? They are not giving you those discounts for free. What they are doing is they're using that card to keep track of what you're buying now and over time. Um, classic stories around that are one supermarket found that uh, people were buying beer and diapers together much more than you would expect by random chance. Uh, and now that's just a, an association in the data, but you can imagine imposing a theory upon that data that, well, you, new parents, you're not allowed to go out and play anymore, you're being deployed to the market, pick up some diapers, hey, I might as well get some beer while I'm here. 
In that case, if you were the supermarket manager, you could also try imagining making some strategic decisions. Well, in that case, why don't I put all the diaper in the back of the store and put our really expensive alcohol in front of it and try to encourage some impulse buys. And the bottom left is a New York Times article that had another very colorful story where Target's product algorithm started sending targeted advertisements to a teenage girl about pregnancy-related products. And when her father found these mailings, he was very upset, went to the store and complained, what are you doing? Completely inappropriate. Why are you sending this to my daughter? Except that what happened was it turned out that Target's algorithm had basically figured out that a teenage girl was pregnant even before her own father had. But, but back to medicine. Um, so here's the basic flow chart kind of uh, describing the process of what I'm trying to do. So we start with our raw electronic medical record data, mostly structured elements, mainly orders that I care about. I'm going to run those through some pre-processing to make these simple timelines of labeled patient events, uh, run them through an association counter to collect some stats on those. And then the idea will be a new patient will show up, and based on their initial information, we will combine that with our historical stats, run that through a recommender engine to generate a list of other clinical orders that might be relevant to your patient that you're seeing right now. Let's make this more concrete. This is the clinical orders that are most common just overall for every patient at Stanford Hospital. So everybody gets IV saline in some form or another. Most people get a CBC in a metabolic panel. And what is our most popular oral medication? Uh, apparently it's DocuSafe. Well, <laughs> it, in any case, um, now here are the clinical orders that are most likely to occur within 24 hours of an admission diagnosis for chest pain. So things that make sense, like you get an EKG, because you're trying to assess for ischemia. And several stats you can derive from that include the baseline prevalence. So forget chest pain, just overall, about 52% of the hospital, patients in the hospital get an EKG. Positive predictive value, that's kind of your post-test probability. Given that you're admitted for chest pain, 93% of such patients get an EKG within 24 hours. That works out about 12 times the odds, tiny, tiny p-value. Now, if your only goal is to just predict what the doctor is likely to want to order next, this is actually a pretty good list already. Although you will also notice a lot of the things that were just common overall, like checking a CBC and metabolic panel, are also common if you're admitted for chest pain. So what might be more interesting is if we were to sort by something like, say, odds ratio, or p-value, relative risk. Um, in this case, now what rises to the top of the list is check a point of care troponin. That makes sense. The blood test to see if you're having a heart attack. And you'll notice that the positive predictive value is actually less than EKG, but is so much higher relative to the baseline prevalence, it suggests that there's something much more specifically relevant about this order for this clinical context. Other things the system's coming up with is, you know, get your patients some nitroglycerin to manage their anginal pain, consult cardiology for help if, um, if you, things aren't going well, um, give them aspirin in case they are having a heart attack, do a cardiac cath if things are going badly, if you're not sure what's going on, get a dopamine stress echo to be stratified. Here is um, another example that's been kind of wrapped into the shell of um, a mock interface at what it might look like if you're doing order entry. So imagine this is the epic order entry interface, but now the system is also, as you're working, it's not going to interrupt you, but as you're working, it's putting other related orders in front of you that might be relevant. So if you knew nothing about the patient, um, the system has nothing to work on, it's just going to recommend this generic bestseller list, the overall common orders. Well, let's say I were to search for a C. diff toxin assay, so a test for C. diff colitis, an antibiotic-associated form of infectious colitis. So now, given that piece of information, the system's going to try to find out things that are relevant. So it says, well, maybe you want to check a stool culture, NOVA and parafites, other diagnostic tests for infectious diarrhea. Maybe, actually, I do want to, you know, I'm going to take this suggestion. I'm going to put this patient into contact isolation because I'm worried they're contagious. Well, now what you notice is with two pieces of information, the system is going to try to incorporate both of those and keep juggling this list of suggestions, in this case, finding vincomycin and metronazole, which would be the actual treatments if you did have C. diff colitis. What if I were next to actually, say, order miropenem, a very broad-spectrum antibiotic, and if the patient had C. diff colitis, this would be exactly the wrong thing to do. So in which case, the system is trying to refactor and rejuggle its suggestions and think, well, maybe it's not C. diff colitis. Maybe you just have broad-spectrum infection, in which case other things like an antifungal medicine, an anti-gram-positive antibiotic start floating to the top. I use this example to point out two things. Um, one is many of the examples I use are based on a diagnosis. I do that just because it's easy to understand, but even without a, a diagnosis or a symptom, just based on what you're doing, just the orders themselves are information to infer the patient context. And if you have multiple pieces of information, the system will use as much as you have, as much as you will give it to try to give you a personalized, um, customized list of um, suggestions. Um, and it aggregates multiple pieces of information through different possible ways. I just put this slide up here to make it look like I know math. This may or may not actually be true. And 
more so it turns out that even if you do something that sounds a little bit more statistically sound using a Bayesian based approach to combine these elements, uh, the final accuracy ends up being no better than if you just use a simple weighted average. So I'm going to move on. Um, so I showed you some specific examples that qualitatively, at least to me, they, they look pretty compelling. They seem appropriate. But I want to assess how well this would work in a general sense. So how are we going to do that? Um, I took a separate set of validation patients, so this is the data for one such patient, and I used the first several hours of that patient's data, um, roughly kind of their emergency room stay, and I used that as input, a query set into the recommender system, have it spit out a list of 10 other orders that might be relevant for this patient, and compared those to the actual orders the patient got within the first 24 hours of their stay. And let's see how well those overlap. Uh, so several different results here. They basically show all the same trends, so I'm going to focus on just one set. Uh, we're going to look here at precision at 10 recommendations. So this is the system comes up with 10 orders. How many of those um, did the doctors actually use during their first 24 hours? So if you're recommending things just at random, I mean, that is hopeless. There are thousands of things you can order in the hospital. A better benchmark would be, let's look at just the baseline prevalence. Just use your generic bestseller list. Always recommend the saline, CBC, and metabolic panel, and DocuSafe, and you will get about 27% precision. Um, you can do a little bit better than that if you use these conditional association stats, and then even better if you apply a time threshold to those, which is something I'm doing different than um, other researchers in this field. Um, the idea there being, if you order an EKG and a chest x-ray with one hour, you know, there's probably something related about those. If you order an EKG now and a blood culture five days later, are those related? It's, it's actually not so clear. I also introduced a couple different measures, which I've been calling inverse frequency weighted recall and precision. Um, so this is recall, so the exact same thing as sensitivity, and summation notation, true positives over true positives and false negatives. Here's the weighted form based on how rare the underlying items are. The concept here is if you correctly predict that I'm going to order a CBC, well, I mean, that's fine. You're probably right, but it's kind of not very interesting, right? Whereas if you correctly predict that I order a dopamine stress echo, well, that's actually pretty cool because that's a very rare order. I think you kind of deserve more points for getting that accurately. So let's look at weighted recalls in the light blue here. Again, at random, it's hopeless. Um, if you use just the generic bestseller list, um, you do poorly, and that's, that's the whole point. I don't think that should do so well in this case because it's not very interesting um, if that, uh, that's kind of a mundane prediction. Um, so it turns out in this case, you want to use something a little more like odds ratio relative risk to get a better result. So this is usually the point in talk where I break for a little bit of discussion because uh, I often have to get ready to start dodging some tomatoes because uh, some people think maybe there's something interesting here, but also get very appropriately worried in ways this could go very wrong. Um, so single center study, inpatient data, that's fine. We could always expand the data set and time scale. What I would think are actually a couple of the biggest concerns with an approach like this, one is, um, would this just lead to overutilization? Um, I would think, actually, yes, that's very possible. I mean, when Amazon gives you a product recommendation, basically all they want to do is to make you buy more stuff. That is not our purpose in medical practice. What I would say to that is, I've really only just been showing the kind of the positive use case as something to focus on, but the same technology could be just as easily applied to the negative use case. Hey, before you order that MRI, did you know that other doctors in similar situations would only order it 10% of the time? Um, and even more so, of the doctors who actually ordered that MRI, did you know that only 2% of them actually found an abnormality that prompted a surgery? Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but that can give you more precise information to make a reasoned decision. Ultimately, that points to what I think is really the biggest concern with this approach is, is the title. Do you believe in the wisdom of the crowd, or do you fear the tyranny of the mob? I mean, because in so many words, what this system is doing is it tends to recommend things that are common. But how do you know the common behavior is actually good ones? Um, it turns out this is actually a really hard question to answer, because there's no such thing really as a gold standard to define what good medical decision making is. Um, there are theoretical reasons and mathematical theorems that suggest why this should probably work. You know, it's the reason why you trust a 12-person jury of your peers and not the decision of a single expert um, judge, for example. But ultimately, what, much of my work is to now to try to find different ways to explore and evaluate exactly that concept. Um, I'm going to start with some aspects looking at outcome predictions. So even though predicting clinical outcomes isn't really what I'm interested in doing, it turns out it's kind of easy to try once you've built this infrastructure. Right, because if I can recommend to you the probability that you're going to order an EKG, well, how about predict the probability that you will die within three days? As far as the system is concerned, it's just another labeled event in the patient timeline. Um, so I went ahead and just tried that to see what would happen for death, need for ICU life support, uh, discharge, and re readmission to the hospital. And it turns out you can get accuracy scores using this very simple approach that are right on par with even state-of-the-art prognosis scores like Apache or CRIB-65 with relatively little incremental effort. 
um, to try to even get more insight into what's going on here, then I try to do the query backwards. Um, now, in this case, instead of looking to the future, I'm starting from a patient event, patient death, and I'm looking backwards in time. What were the orders or lab results that were disproportionately likely to occur in the week prior to death? So stuff that makes sense. Um, you know, comfort care measures, palliative care, because we know the patient's going to die, and we're just trying to make them comfortable. Uh, or maybe um, they have bad lactic acidosis, they're on a norepi infusion, lung protective ventilation, because they're critically on the ICU, and hey, we're doing what we can. Um, I think these insights also give important um, clues to why you have to be very careful about using this to actually drive recommendations towards um, outcomes. That's a very appealing thing to do, but it's potentially dangerous if you don't do it the right way. Right? It is appropriate to say that these things are all predictive of patient death. What it is not appropriate to say is, oh my god, norepinephrine infusions and palliative care consults kill people, so let's stop doing that. That is not the way you want to interpret this data because of confounding by indication. Right? Um, so short of that, though, then, what are some other ways I can at least compare to some external benchmarks um, of quality? So in this case, I'm going to try looking towards um, human authored order sets. Um, I'm going to go through this part quickly, because I think most of the people here are already familiar with uh, clinical order entry. But this is a screenshot from the Epic EMR, State of the Art, how we uh, take care of patients now. And if you want to enter an order for a patient, you search for a term, and you think, I want to order an IV saline bullet. So let's search for some saline. I'm finding saline nasal spray. Um, let me try a few more NS. Bolus, NSIV bolus. Okay, here we go. Four searches, and 10 clicks later, I can at least order a bolus IV and saline for my patient. Several clicks later, I'll order a, a, a lab test, a, a medication, and a blood transfusion, for example. So 85% of the orders in the hospital right now, this is exactly how they happen. You think of an order, and you search for it one at a time, and you pick it out individually. Uh, potentially error-prone process. So the current state of standard of care about how you try to optimize this process is order sets. Um, so you have to break your clinical workflow and say, I, I'm a patient vomiting blood. Has anyone ever thought of this as being a scenario that recurs? And do we have a routine way to approach this? Um, and if you do a search for it, um, you may find that, oh, actually there is. The hospital made an order set for GI bleed with a list of standard uh, orders that somebody, a uh, committee decided thought would be relevant and appropriate for the management of your patient. Although what's interesting, though, is I bet if you surveyed the residents right now, I bet most of them did not even know a GI bleed order set even existed, because I did not until I started doing this research. And, and why is that? If you look at the order sets used uh, most commonly in this hospital during the first 24 hours of the patient's stay, um, those are the most common ones used. And it's nothing patient scenario focused, chest pain, GI bleed, pneumonia, COPD. Um, all of these are just very generic provider focused care processes, right? Because it's too disruptive to my workflow to kind of searching for an order set that might be relevant to my patient, uh, and it may not even exist if I spend the time to do that. Um, if you look at the first 24 hours for our patients, they typically encounter get about three order sets applied to them. That means the doctor is exposed from order sets to about 129 different recommendations of orders they should consider, of which we only use about 11%. That ends up accounting for about 43% of the orders that the patient actually needs or gets within that day. So with this in mind, I've been looking instead for kind of an algorithmic approach. Is there a more automated way to organize and summarize a complex clinical data source? In this case, I took inspiration from probabilistic topic modeling. So what is that? This is um, actually a figure I copied from a review article by David Blay. And this has almost always been applied to text analysis, you know, understanding New York Times articles or PubMed abstracts. Um, in this case, the concept here is what is a document? A, a document is a collection of words. Where do they come from? A collection of topics. And these can be very abstract um, topics. This is the yellow topic, the pink topic, and the green one. But the idea here is that each topic defines a distribution over words that are relevant to that topic. And often is very interpretable what is going on. If you just look at the topic, this is about genetics, this is biology, this is neuroscience, this is computers. And the idea being here, if you want to write a new document, you just say how much different topics are relevant to this document, and you just start picking words out of these distributions using a probabilistic generative process. Okay, this is going to get a lot more concrete in a second. The um, actual, but that's actually not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to write new documents. The, usually the purpose of these algorithms is to, given a body of documents, every New York Times article published in the past 50 years, try to understand the contents of them. What are those underlying topics that drove the creation of those documents? So one way to approach this is if you think of this as a big, as a body of documents, a big word matrix. So here in this matrix, every column represents some article I've cited. Every row is um, some word, and the matrix tells you how often does each word appear in each document. And basically what the algorithm is doing is it's doing a matrix factorization problem. It factors this into two simpler matrix along a smaller number of latent topic dimensions. Okay, totally abstract, I, I know. So let's just look at some concrete examples and this will make a lot more sense. 
Except the thing is here, I'm not trying to do text analysis here. That is, that is not my goal. Instead, I'm drawing a different analogy. Now, a patient is kind of like a document, and the orders and lab results that happen for the patient are kind of the uh, words that appear in that document. If that were the case, I'm going to apply this algorithm to see what the system finds are um, recurrent patterns and um, underlying structure in the data. And worth understanding that you know, this is a computer applying a data process and finding statistical structure in your underlying clinical data, but a computer does not give you meaning. Right? That, that's something that you as a human have to provide. The virtue of this approach is when you look at example topics, this is three example topics and the um, clinical items that are most common in each one, um, it is often very interpretable what is going on. So when I look at this topic, I see checking arterial blood gas, respiratory tech, ventilator settings, uh, epi, norepi. Oh, uh, this topic is about critical care in the ICU. This one, getting insulin, diabetes, AMC. This, this one is about managing somebody with diabetes. This topic is about testing um, bodily fluid, albumin infusion, because they probably have ascites from liver cirrhosis. Here are a few more example topics. And um, what I would just say is, when I've seen other people present this kind of work and unsupervised learning and clustering, I've often thought, I mean, that looks neat. I mean, I can clearly recognize some concepts in here, but I'm still not clear what's the point. You know, what, what do I do with that? Um, there are many possible things you can do, but I'm going to keep running with this idea of finding related orders for your patient. So what I'm looking at here is now this is two topics generated by the system, but they're plotted on an arbitrary x and y axis, defining a two-dimensional space. Um, and each point represents a clinical order, and its position in this 2D space is how related it is to one or both of those topics. And if you look at them, then it looks like uh, the x-axis topic is about a patient who overdosed on a drug and is now on an involuntary psychiatric hold. If you look at the y-axis, this topic seems to be about somebody who has diarrhea or abdominal pain. Um, these orders on the top right are just very common things. They're kind of just related to every topic. The idea here would be a new patient shows up, and based on their initial clinical information, you can feed that into the model, and it'll come back and say, this patient looks like they are 80% about topic X and 20% about topic Y. And if that were the case, which I represent by this blue patient vector here, um, if you wanted to find other orders that are likely to be related and relevant to that patient, you just look for things that are farthest along the projected axis of this patient vector. So in this case, our first suggestion would be, you know, maybe you check the serum Tylenol level, maybe then the EKG, maybe then it's the level, and you just go down the line. So how well does that do compared to, say, existing order sets? Um, so I measured in terms of precision and recall, our same measures, that's positive predictive value and sensitivity. And um, if you to take just the top 10 orders from an order set for a fair comparison, uh, that, that's kind of strange, right? Because you remember the order sets, they're ordered arbitrarily by, uh, by category and alphabetic, alphabetical order. It's very hard to find the important orders in order set. Often they're buried way in the middle. So if you just took the top 10, which is kind of the real world use of them, and to predict what the doctor's actually going to want, the accuracy in terms of predicting what the doctor needs is actually very poor. That's these solid lines here. There's already, forget fancy topic models, just a very simple change you can make to order sets right now. It's just to resort them such that they are most common, the most prevalent ones rise to the top, so at least you're getting the most likely things at the top of the list. If you did that, you would already improve your accuracy to the dashed line substantially. The curves kind of represent the accuracy you get using these topic model approaches, and it's a curve because the x-axis is how many different topics, how many different clusters of data do you want to organize in the system. That's an external parameter that you decide how you want to uh, fraction out the system. All right, coming down to the home stretch here, um, if, uh, if not overt outcomes, what's maybe the next best thing I can do to evaluate the quality of suggestions? Well, let's look to clinical practice guidelines. Um, you know, a simplifying assumption, but for this analysis, let's say practice guidelines are correct. They give you good suggestions about things you should consider for your patient. So I went to the guideline clear class, I looked at PrepMed, and for a few example diagnoses, chest pain, GI bleed, pneumonia, which I chose because they were common enough that I had something to analyze. They have practice guidelines that I can review, and there are hospital order sets that I can compare against. Um, and so then, in that case, I, as a human being, I just read these guidelines, and I look for things that mention clinical orders that are useful. Um, it turns out this is actually still not easy to do, right? Because guidelines by design are very non-prescriptive and tend to require a lot of interpretation to use. Right, so for example, guidelines for GI bleed. Um, recommend you give the patient an intravenous proton pump inhibitor. That's actually pretty easy. Uh, here that means pantoprazole IV infusion is a guideline appropriate order. But here's our next uh, recommendation. Perform hemodynamic status assessment and resuscitation. Strong recommendation. Well, okay, but what is the clinical order that actually maps to? Uh, what is the concrete action I'm supposed to do that reproduces that what that recommendation wants me to do? So this is where I kind of have to put my MD hat on. Um, 
the guidelines never say these words, but I decided if the doctor orders a troponin and a lactate, basically what they're trying to do is hemodynamic status assessment. I'm going to count those as guideline appropriate. If they order IV saline, what they're trying to do is resuscitation, so I'm going to count that. Um, you also have the issue of implied orders. So guidelines for lower GI bleed say, get a colonoscopy. Um, that's easy. Colonoscopy procedure counts, guideline appropriate. But implicit there is you have to be NPO, so you're not allowed to eat anything, and you need a bowel prep. Get a jug of go lightly, give yourself diarrhea to flush out your colon. Um, guidelines, again, never say those words, but implicitly I'm going to count those as guideline appropriate because you couldn't do the colonoscopy without those. So after all that work, where does that get us? Here are the top orders associated with admission diagnosis of chest pain. Same thing I showed you before. But now we have two additional columns of data. They're binary labels. One is showing, was this order ever used in an, one of the hospital order sets for chest pain? And on the right is kind of our outcome label. Was this order ever mentioned as something appropriate to consider um, for the management of chest pain? And if you ever find yourself with a column of scores next to a column of binary outcome labels, what you do is you do a receiver operating characteristic curve. And what that's basically telling you is how well does that score align and predict that binary outcome label. The curves below, what they're showing is just the same data in a different form. It's just illustrating that you have to make a trade-off between precision and recall, sensitivity and specificity, depending on how far down the list of recommendations you're willing to look. Um, I'm going to simply summarize here by basically just saying what this is showing is that if you use one of these score-based order recommendation approaches, it works as well as and maybe even better than the cl existing clinical order sets in terms of aligning with uh, practice guidelines. This trend holds true for other diagnoses like pneumonia. The system thinks maybe shorter blood cultures and antibiotics as well as a uh, GI bleed. So, you know, give them an antacid infusion to suppress the bleeding, octreotide if it's variceal, call GI, do an endoscopy, and transfuse some blood in the meantime to keep the patient alive. So I, I blitzed through these results very quickly because the point here is not, hey, look, I made a better order set for chest pain and GI bleed. I mean, arguably, maybe I did, but even if I did, you know, we already have an order set for chest pain. We already have a practice guideline for pneumonia. So even if I've made a better one, that's probably only of incremental value. I don't, I don't think that's uh, what's most exciting. What I think is far more compelling is when we can use the confidence from these results to look at a scenario like, say, altered mental status. Uh, maybe this is a nursing home patient that's acting progressively confused or sleepy for no good reason. Classic medicine mission. And when you take care of this patient, well, there is no pre-existing order set you can use. And I've checked, there is also not a clinical practice guideline that, that tells you what to do either. But you still have to take care of the patient, so what are you going to do? Well, there's nothing else you can do. You have to just make up some orders off the top of your head. Or you say, well, the last time I admitted an altered patient three months ago, I think I ordered these five things, and I, that patient didn't die, so I guess those were good choices. Or you say... Uh, you consult for one or two other opinions. Hey, neurology, psychiatry, I got an altered patient here. What would you do if this were your patient? Or what if technology like this were available and you and other physicians could make your medical decisions informed by the collective experience of thousands of other doctors right at the point of care? I'm going to leave you to ponder that thought as well as point to a, a few other related and possible uh, directions that this could go. Um, actually, right in here, our, our own department, a lot of work is happening. Nigam Shah, Bob Harrington, Chris Lonkers, who was the former children's CMO, have laid out a vision and a blueprint for the green button, which uh, the idea in so many words is at the point of care, you could push a button and the EMR will just do a retrospective cohort study relevant to your patient on the spot. Um, you know, I've been interested more in kind of the implicit crowdsourcing approach, just looking at the data passively generated from a clinical process. Um, others like Jonathan Mortensen, who's a graduate student at Mark Mewson's lab, uh, tried an explicit approach. Just go to the internet, ask 100 people what they think the answer is to a biomedical question and see where you can get with that. Um, I would also point to, you know, if there were such a thing as an optimal system, it's actually probably not what I've been building. Right? It's, it's actually really probably a combination of the bottom-up and the top-down approach. I've been focusing on this one just because that's where the, the open research is, a lot of unanswered questions are. Um, so maybe one way you could bridge that is an intermediate girl. So I'm pointing this guy in the bottom right. Uh, that's Cliffy from Microsoft Word, if you all remember, 20 years ago. Um, and I was somewhat loath to include him here because most people actually hated him. But uh, he does illustrate a concept. And the concept it would be this. You know, just take care of your patient just as you normally would. Don't get distracted by alerts or prompts. But as you're working, even though you never put in a diagnosis code or even enter a note necessarily, um, the system will be able to use these algorithms to infer, you know, it looks like you're taking care of a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, well, rather than you making up orders off the top of your head, did you know there actually is an order set for DKA? There is an insulin protocol for that. Why don't I just put that in front of you and that put that relevant information available to you? Um, and this is not just some crazy list generated by a computer algorithm. This is evidence-based, literature-cited, expert-vetted, manually curated content from the hospital that you can trust. That, I can imagine, would be a much more palatable intermediary goal, as, even as I'm reaching for um, uh, further paradigms. 
um, many more possible applications. I'm going to go ahead and close here and acknowledge some people, including my senior mentors, um, Russ Altman, Mary Goldstein, Steve Ash, um, Nigam Shah, Lester Mackey, Mike Bayoke, have been providing methodologic expertise as well. Um, the VA Informatics Fellowship under Doug Owens, Ruth Cronkite, gave me a home after residency. Um, some pilot funding from the Learning Healthcare Systems Innovation Fund, the department through the TRAM program, um, had the vision to invest in me even back when I had nothing but just a crazy idea scratched out a two-page proposal. Um, and of course, the Stride Data Group, without which obviously none of this work could be possible. And most of all, to all of you, thank you very much this morning for your attention, and I'll be glad to entertain any questions or comments. of the Duke Data Bank for yep. cardiovascular disease. Um, the question I have is, why let the doctors decide at all? Why not randomize mm -hmm. uh, the system? Why not allow mm -hmm. randomization in the system so mm -hmm. that we could figure out yep. what is the optimal data set? Is that possible in the electronic system we have today? Uh, and the one we have today is probably not the one of the future, and hopefully the near future. It should be. It should be possible, and it should be what we're building. Um, that I think is a very important facet. You know, if if we don't know the true answer, well, why don't we study it as we're going rather than passively have the system come up? You know, 50% of doctors doctors order this antibiotic, 50% will order that one. Well, rather than letting you choose them, why don't you say, I just want a antibiotic, and let the computer pick one of those two? You know, should it be aspirin 81 milligrams or should it be aspirin 325 milligrams? I don't know. I just want my patient to get aspirin. Let the computer decide that in a randomized fashion, use the EMR to follow them, and in that way, we would actually be building knowledge for the future, even as we're practicing today. Actually, a, a huge potential for a lot more um, things that can happen with that. So I think there's three important pieces to that question, actually. I'm going to try to unravel it. Um, there was a great ethics talk by David Magnus in Grand Rounds uh, probably about last year, which kind of got the issue, well, hey, can you just randomize the aspirin 81 versus 325? And his argument was you can because some doctor in the U.S. would do one or the other. We don't know actually which one is better. So um, by the nature, you're not biasing towards something um, dangerous. That's, that's his argument, although there is debate in the field about that. I think kind of the liability question, there's two important pieces there. Um, one is, uh, one key thing is, you, you know, I'm trying to make a decision aid system. Um, I'm not trying to, nor do I even think it's really possible to build a medical automaton, a computer that just takes care of you. That, that's not what I'm trying to build. You're still a human doctor in the loop who has to perceive and interpret the information relevant to your individual patient context. And uh, this is also important because that way the FDA won't regulate this as a medical device as long as there's a human being somewhere in the decision loop. And in terms of liability, I think that's like an interesting question, which I, I kind of don't want to get into, but I think it's interesting because um, whether what the system comes up with is right or wrong, basically what it is telling you is the standard of care. That is what most doctors do most of the time, whether it is right or wrong. And if you ever got dragged into a court of law or in a malpractice suit, it doesn't matter what the guidelines say. It doesn't matter what the latest evidence says. It matters what other competent doctors in your community would do in that similar situation. That is the standard you'd be judged against. So a, a tricky scenario there. Um, I would point you to a JAMA perspective years ago called Winners and Losers that had a very provocative story about somebody who used the latest prostate cancer recommendations, got sued, and lost because other doctors in the community didn't practice the way he did. Um, I think Dr. Cap. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Mm. There is um, definitely potential for biases in multi directed, both at the top level and at the local level. And it, it is kind of a trade off here. I don't think there's one answer to this question. Um, if you have a uh, if you have a great randomized level A control trial evidence, but they only apply to middle-aged white males, you know, maybe that doesn't help your 80-year-old uh, Vietnamese patient, for example. 
Um, so in which case, having that local information actually is probably an untapped resource that we haven't taken advantage of because the technology just wasn't available 10 years ago, so we, there was no way to do it. So finding some way to merge those two sources, I think, is actually, like I said, what I'm building is not the ideal system. This is part of the ideal system that uses the local information, cu personally customized, um, in combination with the top end information when it's available. I don't know if that's a question or... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right, so even if you were to have, say, guidelines, well, people don't use them, so almost, almost what's the point? Um, and that was kind of one of my first points is a lot of practice variability. I mean, I cited an article where, you know, about people get about 55% of the care that they're supposed to get based on high quality evidence. And so I think part of what's here is that's why I'm focusing on both the afferent and the efferent limbs of the learning healthcare system, right? It's not just pulling knowledge information out of the, the data, but I'm also trying to figure out how do I give that back to the doctor in a way that's actually going to influence their behavior in a meaningful way. And um, that's actually a really hard question. I don't have all the answers to that one, but I think part of it is, um, you know, interruptive alerts, I mean, they're good for some things, but eventually you, people will just start ignoring them and overriding them. So something like this, is, which is a little bit more passive and kind of positive in terms of trying to be convenient and helpful, I think could be a way. It's a little bit more subtle and manipulative, but maybe it might be a more effective approach to um, shifting behavior. But a lot of open questions there that warrant future study. Um, I think, yeah, Ed. Um, so, can you tell who's a good doctor? And hey, the people who are good doctors often never touch the computer at all. Um, so, how do you put, the, put that together? So, remind me of the second question because I'm, I'm going to lose it. But the, the first part is how do you tell who's a good doctor? I don't, maybe not necessarily, I'm, I'm not going to so strongly say that I can tell you who's a good doctor, but I can tell you who the deviant doctors are, right? <laughs> um, you, you can see what the normative behavior is and who is three standard deviations away from it. That is very something easily you can do with this system. But they may be positive deviants or they may be negative deviants. Yeah, that's a separate evaluation. But you, identifying that extreme variability is itself worth doing because often there is something worth uh, looking at and either learning from it because they're a great positive deviant or trying to help them if they're not a positive deviant. Um, the second question was, um, people who are often good doctors never touch the computer anyway, so how can you learn from them? Um, this is a little bit of a tricky scenario, um, and that kind of comes at, you know, when you're a resident and you put in the orders into the computer, I mean, that's more or less your job, um, are, does that reflect your decision, or does that reflect the decision that someone told you to make? And um, that's actually a separate thing that takes some, some work to separate out. I mean, one of the studies I'm proposing to do in this near future was, like, to basically compare the PAMP service versus the resident service and see, does it matter if you're learning from attendings or you're learning from residents? The implication there being, you know, resident decision-making may be more, maybe different than an attending level. But if actually all you're doing is what the attending told you to do, um, that's uh, another piece that has to be sorted out. Um, actually, there's a David Chan. He's a, another researcher in PCOR. A lot of his is trying to suss out who is influencing the variability or clinical care, and I think his studies show that basically the intern has no control over what's happening. They're just the scribe. The resident has a huge effect, and the attending also actually has very little effect. Is that right? I think that, I think that was the pattern. So that kind of, I guess, repeat the question. Um, you're presented with a patient case, and the system might present something like a checklist. Um, and how do you know if it's kind of leading to the outcomes you want to do, the better patient outcomes? Um, that's kind of what the whole thrust of what I've been trying to go at. And also, my point is, it's actually really hard to evaluate that. I mean, if you really wanted to know what you would do, is you would just deploy the system out in the wild in a randomized fashion, start measuring patient outcomes, do a trial. And that's how you'd know the answer for sure. Short of that, what I've been trying to do is say, well, can I at least even predict what the practice patterns are? Can I predict what the outcomes are? That gives me some insight. Um, you, it still won't for sure give you that answer because um, confounding by education. There's statistical problems where I can't definitely say that given retrospective data only, but you can gain insights 
that say, well, this does predict real outcomes. Uh, it does align with practice standards. And I would say also that by the nature, doctors are not random actors. We don't, we're not making our decisions at random. The reason those orders are popular is because the doctors are trying to figure out how to give their patient their best care. And so as there's a theorem here that if you believe that the individual actors are more likely than random chance to make the right decision, if you just aggregate all the decisions, that, could, that should converge towards the correct answer, even though um, any individual could very well be wrong. So um, hard to prove with retrospective data, but um, just finding ways to point towards it until I can eventually do a trial would be the way to ultimately answer that question. So, is that fair? I don't, complex question. That was kind of why there's so many aspects to go after. I would imagine you could do something, again, if I deploy this in a, in a real world setting, you would deploy it in a randomized setting and you would measure a patient, did the patient die, were they readmitted, did they end up in the ICU, and see if it happened more or less often with this system available or not. Um, something I'm just in the middle of the works right now, I'm, I'm starting to do some kind of usability testing, so I made a prototype, I'm sitting some doctors down, pretend like you're taking care of a patient with altered mental status, and let's um, see if you're making good decision or not. Some of that requires expert peer review too, because it's still a simulation, and, but um, I would eventually need to do this on real patients to really know the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, so a comment was uh, it actually just right out of the PCOR department, uh, David Sutter published an article that 1% uh, of physicians are responsible for 32% of the malpractice claims. And uh, shouldn't we like screen the bad doctors out if we're trying to learn from this system? Um, there are approaches you can do that and you can apply a qualitative top-down filtering and maybe you give a score. You know, Bob Herring designed something, I trust that. You know, a new intern does something, maybe I don't trust that. That could be a theoretical way you could approach that. There are some doctors you trust more than others, right? Um, the whole conceit of the jury theorem of the law of large numbers, the central limit theorem, is you hopefully don't really have to do too much of that. Um, just by the nature of aggregating th the wisdom of the crowd, right? If you aggregate the information of the masses, the, the weird deviant behavior should naturally be suppressed and converge towards um, what is more likely to be um, right. That's the concept anyway, um, but it would be possible to look other ways where you kind of target certain subgroups to either favor or unfavor. Um, I have not approached that issue yet. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.